Up to seven rockets launched this week, another madness now on KNews. Hi, Lucas here. Welcome to KNews for week 41, 2017. And as always, a big shout out to you, my KNews boosters on Patreon. Thanks for your thrust. First, I want to mention all the rockets which already have launched as I speak on October 9th, which was a Monday. Yep, all three launched on the same day. There was a Long March 2D for China, which took off from Jiuqian, a Falcon 9 from Wandenburg in the US, and Japan's H2A, which launched from Tanegashima. On top Long March was the Remote Sensing Satellite for Venezuela, and I have actually covered that one in week 36 already. I'm not sure if the launch was just delayed or my information was wrong, but important to note is it got to orbit successfully. SpaceX Falcon 9 carried the third batch of 10 Iridium Next satellites to a polar orbit and if you want to know more about that particular constellation, I made a special about it just a few months ago. These are part of the second generation communication satellites flying in a low earth orbit, covering the ground with low latency internet for the company Iridium. And Japan launched its fourth quasi Zenith system satellite on top their H2A rocket. Just to refresh your memory a little, these are satellites which orbit the Earth on very elliptical orbits so that they spend a lot of time above Japan. Once the constellation is finished, at least one of them will always be flying over Japan so that there will be a satellite directly above it at any given time. These were the past three launches and there are four more just ahead. Yep, four. First up is another SpaceX Falcon 9 launching on October 11th from Cape Canaveral in Florida. That's a different launch site, which explains why they can launch two rockets in such quick succession already. On top is SCS-11, which is also called Echo Star 105. The satellite will replace two others, which reached their desired lifespan and are running out of fuel on the geosynchronous slot at 105 degrees west. Falcon 9 will launch in its reusable configuration using landing legs and grid fins on the booster. This means it will land again. After launch, Falcon will head east over the ocean if the weather is fine and the range is free from spectators, which sometimes come a little close on their boats, delaying the launch. Echo Star 105 will cover North America, including Hawaii, with broadcast services like satellite television using different types of radio frequencies, C band and Q band for that matter. The two key differences interesting for customers between C and Q are for one the dish size. While you need a large two or more meter dish to receive a good signal on C, the Q band only requires the standard one meter dish many of you are probably familiar with. Secondly, the C band is more robust when it comes to bad weather conditions, so people living in areas with a lot of clouds or frequent nebula formation will surely appreciate that. Now, because the payload is a relatively heavy communication satellite, Falcon's first stage will have to push the upper one for a little longer, thus won't be able to head back to the landing zone and will instead land on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, named after a spaceship in a sci-fi novel. The upper stage will meanwhile have finished its first burn and begin its 20 minute coasting phase. The second burn will then only take a minute to raise the orbit's so-called apoapsis into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. From there, the satellite will go on on its own and, as most of these, circularize its course around Earth. Next up to launch are two rockets in Russia. A Soyuz on October 12th from Baikonur and a rocket on October Friday the 13th from Plichetsk. Soyuz will carry a Progress spacecraft to the International Space Station, while Rokot will bring a Sentinel-5 precursor for the European Space Agency to orbit. Below the upper stage are the core and side boosters from Soyuz, which will separate individually during flight. The other one is basically a reimagined intercontinental ballistic missile, which now has a much more peaceful job, I'd say. Rocot has three stages from which all burn a hypergolic fuel component mix, unlike Soyuz which burns kerosene and liquid oxygen. Flying to the space station, Soyuz has to wait for the planet to rotate its launch site into the SS orbital plane. Once below, it will take off and follow its 51 degrees inclined track to catch up with it on a lower orbit autonomously. This routine mission makes sure the station is fueled up with enough propellant, food and experiments. 
It sometimes also boosts up the station's trajectory a bit to counter the low but persistent drag from the atmospheric remains at around 400 km of altitude. Yep, near Earth space is not as close to a vacuum as outer space is. Rogue-Cut will on the other hand fly north to put its payload into a polar orbit which as the name suggests makes spacecraft fly by the north and south pole. The Sentinel-5 precursor is launched pretty much provisionally to close the gap of Earth monitoring until the real Sentinel-5 satellite appears 2021. Its main mission is to keep track of the trace gas development in our atmosphere using infrared and ultraviolet light sensors. It will focus on the so-called troposphere, which is the part of the atmosphere we can still survive in up to an altitude of 10 km. With each round trip it will collect round about 20 GB of data, while having a storage capacity of 60 GB. This means it has to fly by a ground station at least every 3 orbits, otherwise data would be lost. Transmitting all this data back to ground shouldn't be a problem though, since it is equipped with a transmitter with a downlink data rate of up to 310 megabits. It would only take 25 minutes to empty its entire storage, but because there are many ground stations all around the globe, this should not happen too often. And the last rocket scheduled for this week is an Atlas V on October 14th from Cape Canaveral. It was actually shifted back from last week due to an upcoming storm front. On top is again a secret payload for the National Reconnaissance Office called Enroll 52, which is speculated to be Quasar 21. This is a code name for a spy satellite which detects and observes other spy satellites. Spyception basically. Atlas will fly in its 4 to 1 configuration using a small 4 meter wide fairing and two solid rocket boosters on the side. The core is powered by a single Russian RD-180 engine which has two combustion chambers and nozzles. The center upper stage above uses one RL-10 engine, hence 241. Launching from Cape Canaveral means the satellite won't be shot into a polar, but instead into an equatorial orbit which will likely be geosynchronous. However, this is all pure speculation, so I can't really give you any details on that. As usual for the secretive launches, the live broadcast will end rather quickly, but I will still link all of them in the description. Ok, that shall conclude this week's episode and I hope to see you next one if you like. Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching. <music>